I'm going to do an update on brachytherapy very quickly. I have 20 minutes. This is one of the major options for treating prostate cancer. There's good data to show that brachytherapy is being chosen less frequently, and fewer of our residents are being trained to perform this procedure. And this is not just because lower risk disease is less common, although that's contributing to it. We used to do a lot of cases, and now we don't do that many, but we still do them. Uh, and when it's done, sometimes it's not being done appropriately. And actually, there's some evidence to suggest that this might be one of the best treatments, and it's probably more effective than some of the other treatments. I'm not going to talk about some of the technical developments in future directions. So this is one of the recent studies that basically shows the trends and the percentage of patients. So you can imagine that if the absolute number of low-risk patients and favorable patients with prostate cancer being diagnosed, this is even having a bigger effect. But this is the decline in brachytherapy. That's that, uh, that, that second, uh, that second uh, curve there. Um, and in addition to that, this is a study looking at residency training programs and what's happened. Uh, and both academic and non-academic centers, there's been a significant reduction in the, in the uh, training of residents to do brachytherapy. So I anticipate that this trend will continue. And then if you look at how it's being used, you can see at the bottom of this curve down here, these are the high-risk patients. They are patients with high-risk disease who are getting brachytherapy as monotherapy, which may not be a good idea uh, and is not in compliance with NCCN guidelines. So, Again, it's becoming done less frequently and not always done in compliance with guidelines. And then you have data like this. This is from a very sophisticated analysis performed by Stephen Frank and uh, an economist from, from Harvard or a business, actually somebody from the Harvard Business School. And they looked at um, brachytherapy, proton beam radiation, and radical prostatectomy, and using a validated quality of life instrument. Here they're looking at one year um, at the one-year time point. And you can see that for most things, vitality and so forth, there are some differences, but they're relatively small. But when you look at um, you know, the overall treatment cost and, and um, the brachytherapy, there's a trend for brachytherapy to really could be, you could argue, this the best treatment for the money. So that's sort of the background and moving us into where we are with respect to what's relatively new. This is uh, data from our phase three randomized trial. We were attempting to evaluate whether or not patients with intermediate risk disease really needed to get external beam radiation in combination with their brachytherapy. So patients were randomized uh, who had favorable uh, intermediate risk disease um, to external beam radiation with brachy versus brachytherapy alone. Uh, they had to have either a PSA between 10 and 20 or a Gleason score of 7 with a PSA of less than 10. So these are pretty favorable intermediate risk patients. And traditional uh, treatment, as you would expect. Uh, these are the characteristics of the patients. And uh, there were 443 uh, patients that were valuable for five years. And this slide just shows a so-called futility calculation to show that we should stop the study, that we weren't going to find anything different than what was suggested um, at this interim analysis. And this is about toxicity and efficacy. So if you looked at freedom from progression, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the brachytherapy alone versus brachytherapy plus external beam radiation, suggesting that there's no difference between the two uh, groups. Uh, and you could use a Phoenix, you could use the old Astro, you could look at metastasis and overall survival. There really wasn't a difference. Again, this is biochemical failure using uh, the Phoenix definition. Favorable results. And then if you look at toxicity, the toxicity tended to, to be a little bit higher, although not dramatically so, when you add the external beam to brachytherapy. So this data may establish brachytherapy as the appropriate treatment in favorable intermediate risk patients based on data from a randomized trial. And that was really what the conclusion was, a little bit more toxicity if you add the external beam and no improvement in the patient outcome. Now, the next question is, well, how does brachytherapy compare to external beam radiation? And many of us were already convinced years ago that brachytherapy would be better than external beam radiation. This is from an old study that we did some 10 years ago looking at favorable patients, um, and we did a match comparison of patients treated with external beam radiation versus brachy. 
And we, for our primary endpoint was really uh, the PSA nadir and the uh, MR spectroscopy findings. So you know that uh, with uh, cancer tends to have um, high choline and healthy prostate has high citrate. And if you have ablation of cancer and normal tissue, you get metabolic atrophy after radiotherapy. And we looked at the degree of metabolic uh, atrophy after external beam versus uh, brachytherapy, and it was much more dramatic um, after brachytherapy, complete metabolic atrophy versus uh, after external beam radiation. And if we looked at the PSA uh, level, uh, the PSA, uh, the median PSA, and this is with short follow-up, at five years, our PSA is less than 0.1, the median PSA after brachytherapy. So brachytherapy is much more ablative, but that doesn't prove that the outcome is going to be dramatically better, but we sort of thought it was going to be better. And again, this is, this is a match comparison with the people from the proton trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, 79 gray of protons versus a permanent implant. And if you look at the percentage of patients who had a PSA of less than 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 1, or greater than 1, even with high-dose protons, the ablative effects on the prostate were not as impressive as a, as, a, as a permanent implant. So now we have a randomized trial. This is a Canadian study, the so-called ASCEND trial. This is now dose-escalated uh, external beam radiation combined with hormone therapy. Uh, so they got a total of a year of, of hormone therapy. And they either got dose-escalated external beam or they received a brachytherapy uh, implant. And these patients had either unfavorable intermediate risk or high-risk disease. You can see that 40% of them were Gleason scores eight or above. 69% of them were NCC and high risk. Uh, about 20% had uh, PSAs over 20. So these are unfavorable patients by and large. And in a multivariate analysis, it was clear that adding the brachytherapy improved the outcome uh, relative to any of the other endpoints. And if you look at the, uh, the biochemical control rate, which was the primary endpoint in the study, this is, again, high-level evidence that in terms of biochemical control, adding brachytherapy improves the outcome. But we're doing less brachytherapy. Uh, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how these data affect, uh, affect the practice patterns. The, the data are actually more impressive than they look just looking at that curve. This is, uh, that was by the so-called Phoenix the definition. So if you look at the uh, biochemical control with the, um, if you use a Nader plus two definition, which is the definite standard definition with radiation versus a surgical definition, a PSA of greater than 0.2 with radical prostatectomy, you can see that compared to external beam radiation, the brachy patients had a much more impressive degree of ablation of, gla of the gland, uh, suggesting that, um, you know, this is just more effective at, at, at destroying the prostate and potentially the cancer as well. Uh, and uh, although it did not reach statistical significance and that wasn't the primary endpoint of the study, uh, there is a trend to suggest that the uh, brachytherapy patients might actually uh, uh, live longer and if the trial were much bigger, it'd be likely to, uh, to improve the overall survival. The only problem was that the toxicity was a bit higher in the brachytherapy group. The grade three toxicity was somewhat higher. Um, and at six years, a persistent grade three, about 6%. Now, this is, there are opportunities to improve the, um, the brachytherapy in terms of reducing uh, toxicity. So the take-home uh, points are the brachytherapy is being chosen less frequently, and the trend is likely to, work in, to, to worsen because we're not training residents to do brachytherapy much anymore. That the people that are using it are sometimes using it inappropriately. Brachytherapy as a monotherapy may be uh, a treatment of choice in favorable patients, uh, that is favorable intermediate risk patients. And if you look at those patients that were included on the ASCEND trial, unfavorable intermediate risk and the high risk patients, those results would compete favorably with any radical prostatectomy series and I think are, are, are a good treatment option for those patients uh, with, with more advanced disease. Thank you for your attention.